Welcome to another edition of our series of interviews with prominent Leonians. And today, I am so pleased. We have Mary Heffern as our special guest. And Mary, I have to say that when I put together a short list of who I wanted on this program, you made the cut on the short list. So really looking forward to our discussion. I just want to remind people that the purpose of this is to introduce Leonians to their neighbors, people who have distinguished themselves through their commitment to the community, people who have made a difference in what Leonia is today. And for people in the future, looking back, they can view this recording and get a sense of who Mary Heverin was and uh, what, what really made you excited about Leonia and, and your contribution. So, Mary, I, I appreciate your spending some time with me, even before this meeting, so that I, I could ask you a few questions that uh, would help us unpack your, your journey. Um, and I, I'd like to start, if you don't mind, you, you were really so interested, back in high school, and, and this was in Bergenfield, Correct. In, in music, yes. and even back then, you were a political activist. That's true. You were involved. So, Tell us a little bit about those days. Okay. Well, first of all, um, music at Bergenfield High School was just the most wonderful experience. They still, to this day, have a world-renowned music department. But, you know, being a high school student in the 60s, it also meant that there were some things that I wanted to change. One of the easiest ones for me was uh, we had a rule in those days. This was a public school, mind you where girls were not permitted to wear pants to school. Mm. With the exception that if it was a cold day, we, most of us walked to school, then when you got there, you had to remove the pants, you know, go to the girls room, put it in your locker, and that was that. Well, one day I decided, you know what? This is ridiculous. I'm not changing. So of course, immediately I was sent to the principal. So you didn't change from pants into your No, shirt. no, just left the pants on and called into the principal's office. He explained to me again about the dress code, which I was aware of. Okay, so I had to leave, I went home, and I never told my parents, because they were both working, so they weren't home, okay? So um, then I decided the, the next day, all right, I, I guess I have to abide by these rules. But when I arrived at school, now I, I was in a class of almost 500, not the entire school, just my class. And the girls were all wearing pants. And I thought, wow, this is great. Did and, I do this? Right. <laughs> and from that day on, the rule was changed. The dress code uh, was changed so that girls would be permitted to wear pants. And it, it opened my eyes, too, that if there's something important to you and, and you want to try to affect change, you should do it. Do it peacefully. Do it appropriately. But do it. Right. And, and you've, all, you've always been fine-tuned to a sense of justice and equality. Absolutely. And I'm sure this experience helped forge the, the way for things to follow. That's true. Because we will get to your tenure as the second mayor, second female mayor in, in Leone, which was an exciting time. Um, when you, you moved to Leone, after you graduated from Centenary College. University, yeah. well, University, University yeah. today, yes, mm -hmm. uh, with your degree in music, mm -hmm. and that you moved to One Seventy Six Fort Lee Road. That's correct. T tell us a little bit about that community because that was your first introduction to. That was my the first, and and uh, so the reason, if you'd like to know this, the yeah. reason I ended up in that building was I had a piano, and any time I was looking for an apartment to rent, the uh, landlord owner would say, oh, oh, no, no piano. One place did say, okay, but you have to put it in the basement of the building. <laughs> so I said, well, that's not happening. In the meantime, my mother was friendly with a couple who both sang at the Metropolitan Opera. And they lived in that building. And at 176, at 176 Fort Lee Road. And so, you know, if they didn't allow the piano there, well, who would? So I went, there was an apartment available for rent, and I went there, and so not only was I able to play my piano, but I became friendly with the couple that was singing at the Met. And in fact, 
the, they were in the basement apartment, I was on the third floor. So when I had to do the laundry, I would go down, put my laundry in, and then sit there and listen to them rehearse. And it was such a treat, so. I also, at the time, people thought I was there with my parents, because I was very young. I was right out of college, I had just gotten married. And you married your high school sweetheart. I did, I married my high school sweetheart. And so when these lovely, elderly people, who by the way are probably, <laughs> were probably my age now, um, they were so kind and generous. Uh, I still remember the Montefalcone family. Uh, I still, you know, remember how they were so willing to make me feel comfortable and welcome. But I should mention, now that I'm remembering, yeah. this was also a time when that generation was used to, if you got a letter saying the rent's going up, the rent's going up, nobody questioned it. And these older women were feeling like, I can't afford it. I'm on a fixed income or I'm a widow, whatever it may be. So I went to the Borough Hall, this was way before I got involved in Leonia politics, to find out, like, what were the options? Well, boy, did I find out a lot. I found out about a rent leveling board, and I found out about proper notification that it had to be 30 days, all of that. So when I came back to the building, I, had, I was, you know, 21 years old. I had a little meeting um, <laughs> to tell these people, no, they can't do this. So um, that was really the Leonia beginning, I guess. Where uh, that is that is really cool, and yeah, I'm sure yeah. all your neighbors appreciated they that did. additional they, research. They that, really that did. They did. Yes. It wasn't long before you started to have a family. That's right. right. All right. Yes. Yeah. That's and, true. And I remember you telling me that that building was very special because it was like a community within a community. It so true. So true. Just, uh, when my well, daughter was born, she was born in October. And then, you know, as the months got colder and I'd want to bring her out in her carriage, first of all, the carriage was down the basement. I was on the third floor. So I would carry her down, put her in the, in the carriage, but then there was that question of two more steps out to the street. All these women, first of all, you have to put a hat on her. You have to put another sweater. You know, they were all like little grandmas, you know, and just so lovely. Eventually, they would uh, watch my children for me. You know, if I had to go out somewhere just quickly, they said, D don't take those kids out in the winter. They're little kids. We'll watch them for you. Lovely people. That's wonderful. So your, your introduction to Leonia, you clearly liked what you saw. Very You, you felt, you know, very, very well. And it was a special community. And, you know, life takes some um, challenging turns yes. every once in a while. And I, I know that what happened shortly thereafter was certainly a challenge for you. Your, your daughter was um, five years old. Your, your son was maybe five months old. Yes. And if, if you could say, because I think that this experience that you went through helped form your perspective in helping others later. Absolutely. So yes, it was quite a shock to me. As we mentioned before, he was my high school sweetheart. I was very much in love with him. I was out one day when I came home, there was a note on the table and it, I was devastated and I was almost afraid to tell my family because, you know, they didn't want me to be so upset and I thought he'd come back and all of this. Well, the people in the building, my friend Janice heard about this, I confided in her. Without my asking for any help. Suddenly, people were inviting me to dinner. The rectory at St. John's Church, every Monday, come for dinner so that I make sure you and Lisa, you know, my son was still a baby. Sure. Um, the Catholic school where Lisa was, uh, Sister Cecile waived the rest of the tuition for the rest of the year. Um, so many families said, listen, um, my daughter is in eighth grade at St. John's. She can walk Lisa home. Don't bring the baby out, you know. Uh, people were making uh, dishes like big lasagnas and saying, you know, my husband is sick of lasagna. Would you mind, you know, eating it? Of course, that was made up. Um, there was a young girl made that, so that you could, could I actually, I could benefit from it. And a young girl next door to me, she worked in the bank and they had a turkey raffle. And I was so, you know, devastated by everything. I wasn't thinking clearly. And she said, guess what? You won the raffle. I hadn't even entered it, but I didn't even consider that. I said, great, what did I win? She said, a whole turkey and all the trimmings. 
but she had arranged it. And so many people came out to help me. And I will never forget that. And in fact, uh, when I spoke about my journey through that time into when I was mayor, yeah. I said, the people of Leonia came to my rescue, my children's rescue, and I vowed then that I would give back to the town I loved so much. And you did. Thank you, you really did. Thank and you. Uh, we're, we're going to talk a lot more about, uh, about that. Um, that. That story just by itself, it resonates for so many reasons and it speaks to how special Leonia is. You were down and the community rallied and helped you through a difficult time. And, and I, I think that's uh, marvelous. And I also know that you, you had the sentiment of political activism. Mm -hmm. you, you have the sense of justice and, and giving back. So you, you started to get involved and one of the first things that you were involved with was the Rec Commission, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a funny, very funny story about your son that I want to hear at the pool. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Davidson. Yes. But uh, those early years of getting involved. Yes. Um, talk a little bit about that. And we'll talk about the pool. Sure, story. sure. Well, I'm not the most athletic person. In fact, I'm not athletic at all. Um, and I wanted my children to learn how to play baseball and softball and basketball, whatever there was. And the Recreation Commission in, in town, again, was just a wonderfully welcoming place. And I also, by the way, I forgot to mention this when we spoke, I never realized that all the equipment that they gave to my kids, which normally at that time people would you know, have to pay for, I was given it and never realized. I thought every kid in Leonia got all of this. And Barbara Davidson, who was then rec director, was just a wonderful person. And anybody that had known about what I had been through was there for me again. Talk a little bit about Barbara Davidson. She's, you know, a special person in town. And uh, I think more people need to hear a little bit about her. Sure, sure. Uh, what I loved about Barbara was her enthusiasm. And she loved kids. And she made sure that, you know, let's say, for example, my kids were also not the most athletic. But it didn't matter. You know, everybody was, you know, taught what to do. Uh, my daughter was in second grade and wanted to play catcher, and she was about this big. But you know, uh, Barbara never of said all um, of all positions, right? And uh, but you know, she always encouraged the kids. Um, the Leonia pool also was a, a place where other moms could I could be with and talk to them and compare stories about you know becoming a mother and at different ages, infancy, preschool, first grade. What to expect. Right? Yes, yes. And, and it was Barbara, wasn't it Barbara who taught your son how to swim? Yes. Literally before he could walk. Literally. So it was his birthday in June. And a little before that, when the pool had opened, Leone, as you know, has a baby pool, cement built in. So I'm sitting on the edge and I'm talking to my friends. And one of the mothers said, uh, excuse me, Mary, I think your baby is drowning. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, he does that in the bathtub. He likes to go under the water. And, you know, so Barbara saw that and she said, you know what? This kid needs to know how to swim. I said, he doesn't even know how to walk. She said, don't worry, I got it. All right. So, so I, this is what's special about Barbara. Yes, right. So we're at the pool this one particular day, his birthday, actually. And uh, during adult swim, the pool would clear out of all the kids and would just be adults. But I wasn't going in that day, and I'm talking to my friends, and all of a sudden I hear all these lifeguard whistles blowing, and often in the summer they have what they call drills. So I thought, oh, it's just another drill, nothing to worry about. But then everybody started standing up and looking toward the main pool and looking up because a one-year-old baby, my son, was at the top of the high dive. Which was 16 feet high back then. Amazing, right? So I, of course, panicked. So I ran over to the pool and Barbara saw it immediately. She jumped in, she stood under the high dive. Come on, buddy, you can do it. Now I, not being a swimmer, I'm thinking he's gonna jump in and pop up and swim over to me or to her. Oh no, he jumped in, he went all the way to the bottom, and swam across 
the bottom. So by the time he got to the side, it seemed like an eternity. But when he came up in the pool, you could hear a pin drop. When he came up, he spit water out and said, again, mommy? <laughs> <laughs> That's a character. Yes, yes. I don't think mommy allowed him no, to do that. No, that is for sure. No, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, I love stories like that. Mm -hmm. So, you continue to be involved in town. Yes. You're raising your children. You're involved in town. After the rec center, what were some of the other things that you start to get involved with? Because I will quickly get to your being mayor. Sure. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, quite quite a journey. Yes. So what were some well, of, some of the other things I was involved in, Home and School Association, and I was actually head of the education committee, being a teacher, you know, yes. and uh, we, you know, had some things we wanted to change or discuss about the, the education of our children, which was always good, but there were some new things happening, you know, and we wanted to talk about those. Uh, I also was involved with helping other people get elected, you know, stuffing envelopes and going door to door and standing out in front of what was the co-op, uh, handing out brochures for people. Um, again, getting back to your comment about my sense of justice and, you know, when, when things are not right, it really bothers me. Bothers you. And I feel like you I have to do, to do something. You're absolutely right. So, yes. And not everybody steps up. That there's, is true. There's awareness, and that's yes, good. That's right. always the first step. But right. there's engagement. Yes. And then there's real engagement. Yes, this and is And I true. think that you are the, the yes. last yes. real yes. engagement. Yes. What, what prompted you to even consider running for mayor? Well, can we go back to running for councilwoman oh, more quickly? Oh, actually, yes. <laughs> the council, because you are a council person for three terms. Three terms. Right. Three consecutive terms, mm -hmm. nine years. So Liz Dwarka, who was the first woman mayor, uh, she, and I would help her. I got her elected. We would have talk about politics. Whenever there was an election, she would what we call count the votes at her house. And I would go and we congratulate the winners. Okay. So one day she said to me, listen, Mary, I think you should run for the town council, to which I said, uh, absolutely not. Really? Uh, so your I, first reaction was, was no, no way. No way. I, I, I said, because I had a misunderstanding, I said, I don't get involved. I'm very passionate about politics, but I know it can be, you know, a little dirty, if you will. But also, it would have meant I was running against two incumbents. Jim Tappan, who I oh, voted for in the last election, and a beloved man, uh, Jose Alvarez, oh. who was the head of the DPW, a uh, man who came over from Cuba, a self-made oh, man. Oh, we recognize those names immediately. Immediately, right. Well, Liz said to me, please, you know, we really do, we want you to run, we want, okay. So I finally agreed to it because I was sure, Bill, that I would lose. So I figured, okay, th this is a way to get her off my And I, I actually, without taking anything away from you, I understand why you would say that. Yeah, Because sure. Jose Alvarez and right. Jim Tappan were yes. incredibly popular. Yes, and, and good people, yes. you know, so I thought, all right. Well, the night of the election, as we were counting the votes in Liz's house, and the, the numbers were coming in, and I realized, oh my goodness, I won. And a funny story, I'm a Democrat, lifelong Democrat, my parents... God rest their souls, but lifelong Republicans. So when I called my parents to tell them I won, my mother answers the phone from Liz's house, you know, calling. I said, Mom, you're not going to believe it. I won the election in the town council. She said, hold on, the Democrats on the phone. <laughs> I hope she forgave. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. She was so proud of me, of course. So, um, and also I should mention that both Jim and Jose, which is protocol, they came to Liz's house to congratulate me. And I remember Jose to this day said, if it couldn't be me, I'm glad it was you. Such a wonderful person. He was. Yeah. There wasn't one person who didn't like Jose. You're absolutely right. It's absolutely true. right. It's true. Yeah. So what was it like, expectations versus reality, being on the council? Well, the first meeting, I sat there and thought, what have I done? <laughs> And um, Liz was very supportive because she was no longer mayor, but was on the council. So, you know, she would sometimes like if I was hesitating, she, you know, it's OK. It's who, was, okay. who was the mayor after Liz? Um, right. At, well, when I, my first year, yeah, yeah. it was Judah Ziegler. 
Oh, his first time he ran as an independent and oh, yes. So uh, and then it was Larry Kirk. No, then it was Paul Kaufman. Right. Then it was Larry Kirk. Okay. So um, but I was really interested in doing the right thing for the people. You know, this wasn't an ego thing. I am not the lawyer looking for a stepping stone. I, I, I did this because I care about this town and its people. And I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to cast my vote, not only using my conscience, but to represent the people who elected me. Right. Not what Mary wanted. Right. Okay. What is best for Leon? Right. And I'm very big on process and procedure. So I took a course at Rutgers mm -hmm. about people in government. And I, I took it in every possible offering they have. I took and got certificates for it so that I knew everything about budget. This is before I ran for mayor. Mm -hmm. Budgeting and, and the finance, personnel. And it was wonderful because I really learned about the workings of government. It was not, okay, yeah, so now I'm a councilwoman. I'll just sit here and say yes or no. No, I took it very seriously. So what you learned actually was applied to your Absolutely. job and made you more effective. Absolutely. Possible. Yeah. Three consecutive terms of three years. So that's nine years on yes. the town council. Yes. What prompted you to consider mayor? Well, my mentor and former mayor, Robert Pacheco, he said to me, you know, Mary, you've done such a wonderful job as councilwoman. People really respect you. People look to you for advice. I think you should run for mayor. Now, at the time, I was fortunate enough because my children were older, it's very difficult for a woman to run for mayor when she has young children. Even if you're not a single mom as I was, because often, with all due respect to fathers, often it's dad's got to stay late at the office or he's traveling, and mom's left with the child and taking them to soccer practice or baseball, whatever it may be. But my children were older by this time, so I thought, I think I could do this. And I was fortunate enough, no one ran against me. I ran uncontested. Wow. Well, you had quite a reputation yes. by then, yes. too. Yes, yes, yes. And based, based on the fact that you always did what you thought was right for Leonia. So even if people disagreed with you, they would never fault you for your motivation. No. That's my right. recollection. Right, right. In fact, one of the councilmen, when I was on the council, went to a, a, another person who this town will recognize the name of Jack Peters yes. because he was the fire chief at the time. Sure. And this councilman went to him and said, you have to talk to Mary, something's wrong. So Jack said, oh, something's wrong? What do you mean, is she all right? And this person said, she doesn't vote the way I tell her to vote. No. <laughs> and Jack, you know, he had that great laugh. Yeah. He's like, oh. There's nothing wrong with her, and you're not going to convince her. If she feels that that's not the right decision, you're wasting your time. So, well, that right. says a lot. And, yes. And we all miss, uh, we all miss Jack. Yes. He's yes. a bigger than life. Bigger than life, yes. Kind of guy. Um, before we talk about some of the things as mayor, is it true that you never missed a meeting in 13 years? It's absolutely true. Absolutely true. In fact, I was scheduled to perform a wedding ceremony right before one of the Monday night meetings and my mother passed away that morning. Oh my gosh. And first I thought, how am I going to tell this couple? You know, they had all their guests and the flowers and everything. And I, the, 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 at the time, the borough clerk and other people, the administrator, they knew what had happened. But I said, no. I mean, the council president could have taken over, that's protocol, but I, I just said, no, I made this commitment, and I, I came to the meeting and led the meeting. Well, that speaks to commitment and yes. dedication, yes. not wanting to disappoint somebody who yes. had planned on the mayor performing the ceremony, yes. so yes. I applaud you for, you for doing that. I think it's illustrative of you know, that dedication. Um, during your term in office, so it was 2007 mm -hmm. to 2011, it's mm -hmm. a four-year term, what were some of the, the big issues that you had to deal with? Yes, well, number one was communication. Um, when people would call the borough hall to say, look, I have this giant pothole, or my garbage didn't get picked up, 
Um, you know, often if the phone were, you know, people were busy at work, leave a voicemail, people wouldn't get back to residents. So I had suggested and called in a company to develop a, a website for the borough that was actually interactive, meaning if I was a resident complaining about something, right. let's say the pothole again, you would fill out your address and what was the concern was, and it would immediately be forwarded to the correct department. And then sure enough, through that same website, you get your answer. And this was this was the first, the first. borough website. The first, yes, yes. I think that's Yeah, so that was great. Cool. Also Wood Park, uh, which was always a great park, but needed a refurbishing. So we got a $400,000 grant, not tax money, grant money to redo uh, Wood Park. And, and that was important. Um, pedestrian safety. You had a very unfortunate uh, yes. death, actually. That's right. That's right. Someone was about to cross the street and, you know, Fort Lee Road and Broad Avenue, especially in the morning, can be very dangerous. So we did some work with that. Um, the light rail, which I don't know if we'll ever see it I in my lifetime. <laughs> I'm certain. Yes. Yeah, so um, we had some town meetings about that because, again, I feel we need the people's input. We cannot vote, I don't believe, unless we have input from the people. Now, you can't have input on every single thing, and you can't talk to 10,000 people. That's why you have elected officials. Right. But it's important to get a sense and to give people the, the hope that, yes, they do have a voice. And in terms of, of talking to people, you mm -hmm. really, in addition to the website, you, you made some extraordinary outreach. You may have been the very first, or one of the first, to do regular office hours. Mm -hmm. As mayor, it was on Tuesdays between 4 and 8 p.m. And, right. and whoever in town wanted to come in and talk to the mayor mm -hmm. would avail themselves of that opportunity, and you were there to listen and, mm -hmm. and support them. And also, people didn't always go to mayor and council meetings. Right. They might be intimidated, exactly. but they could still... Mm -hmm. So that worked out. Yes, very well. Yeah, pretty well. Mm -hmm. Now, as the uh, as the first female mayor, as the second female mayor, are there any advantages to being a female mayor versus a male mayor, or it's completely the same? What What's your take on that? Well, it's unfortunately quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. When I was first elected that November, I mean, yes, the election was November. I didn't take office till January. I went to something called the League of Municipalities, which is all the, the professionals, the mayors, the council members looking to, you know, buy things or improve services or be educated. But you also get to meet other elected officials. So as I walked through, and at that time, Jack Terhune was our borough administrator, and he knew everybody at the time. And so he'd walk through the convention center and say, oh, hello, so-and-so, this is our new mayor. And if it was a man, they would be, yeah, right. right. They thought he was joking. And that he said, he was very embarrassed. He said, no, no, she really is. Also, um, I would go to mayor's meetings. I'd be, there were other women at the time, Republicans, Democrats, and a few other towns in Bergen County. But the men were, they really didn't know how to react to me. In yeah. this day and age, I, I found Because this is 2011. Yeah, we're, thank we're you. Talking. Right, we're not talking, you know, 1950. Right. And, um, you know, I was either perceived by certain men, not all, believe me, as, you know, where'd she get that crazy idea? She's nutty. Um, and, and even Robert Pacheco said to me, I never realized how dismissive and how not inclusive some of the elected officials who are men, not in this town, although there were a few, uh, who did not respect me. And I had shown that I should be respected. Right. So um, it was very, very difficult. But, you know, I, I for, forged ahead and did okay. You know, I never backed down. I never thought, you know, oh, you know, no, that would be the last thing I would do. So I stood up for myself in those instances too. And a lot of people ended up respecting me for that as well, because it was challenging to be a woman as a mayor. Thank you for sharing that, Mary. That, uh, uh, that resonates. And irrespective of whether you're a, a male or a female, being mayor, what was the most rewarding aspect of being mayor? And what was the opposite of that? Okay. Well, using the example of male-female, 
the most rewarding thing was being a role model for young girls and going to events with the Girl Scouts in town. Mm -hmm. I was a Girl Scout. And of course, when they found that out, the mayor was a Girl Scout. You know, that was a big deal. Um, also, young people, I wanted the young people to have a voice under 18. So I, I started this committee called the Mayor's Advisory Works Committee. Great, of high school students. High school students, high school students. Great idea. And your son was one of the members of that advisory and, committee. And if I remember correctly, it was your idea that launched the Memorial Garden, Garden adjacent yes. to our current police station. Yes. Not for the people in the future. That's right. the, yeah. the old police station. <laughs> And that was for his Eagle Scout project, yes, that and that was. was an enormous success. Yes. So thank you You're very welcome. for that. Yes. And, and that's special to Leonia, mm -hmm. too. What, on the flip side, wasn't so much fun? Okay. On the flip side was, here we go again, with the not-so-great part of an internet. Um, Leonie, a group of people in Leonia started something called the List Cern. Oh, and yeah, which I think you're this familiar with. Yes. And what it basically was was a forum for people to say whatever they wanted to, and that's freedom of speech, and I understand that. However, people in this town who people at one time respected would put things out into the town that were not true. Now, bad enough if it was just a personal thing. It was things about like, you know, we're going to tear down all the houses on Spring Street to make room for the light rail. Not true. Many things like that. So I would spend a lot of my time having to undo, educate, unwind, unwind everything. Right. People would, you know, read and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. We're going to a meeting. They would show up, you know, 50, 100 people. And I knew why they were there, but I'd say, all right, I'd like to suspend the order of business. To, I would like to explain to the public what is really going on. And I would. Oh, all right, now we're going back to this. They'd all leave because right. what they had been you told. Just used to the right, right. Right. The inciting that had happened was. But what you food. saw at the vanguard of mm -hmm. you know, the internet and, and people getting behind the keyboard, not feeling accountability for no. what they write, right. or responsibility that it is good information. That's a, that's a problem, yeah, and it was. ripples through the community. Yes. Mm -hmm. let, let me conclude on, a, on, on this point. I, I know through your outreach to the community, you had the regular office hours, as we mentioned, and, and one day you had shared with me that a young woman comes in, and she is very upset. Can you tell us about that meeting? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, you know, here I am sitting on a Tuesday evening, wearing my suit and my Leonia pin and looking very official. And um, this woman comes in and I said, oh, hi, you know, can I help you? And she was in tears. She said, um, Mayor, I'm devastated. Uh, my husband left me and I'm a single mom with, with small children. And someone suggested that I come to see you, but Mayor, I don't know how you can help me. I said, well, I know how I can help you. I said, years ago, I was sitting where you are sitting today. I was in a situation that I never expected, and the people of Leonia came to my rescue. And for that reason, I will always be grateful, and I want you to know that whatever it is that you think you can do, go for it, because the woman you're talking to now, who you look up to at one time, was just who you are. Thank you for sharing that. That, that is really touching. And uh, I want to thank you for spending time with me today as You're part of welcome. our you know, interview series. Very welcome. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Yes, you will. Thank you.